So the shift program is for people who are working a full-time job and they have figured out that there is something more to life. They figured out that this whole nine to five thing just isn't for them and they know there's something else out there. They know that more is possible and they want to go after it. You are listening to educationhackers.com, podcasting from Vancouver, Canada. Education Hackers highlights successful entrepreneurs with great online courses. And now to introduce today's guest, is e-learning evangelist Steve Atwall. Today I'm very happy to have Jeff Steinman on the show. Jeff wants to help you live more. He's the author of How to Quit Working, A Simple Plan to Quit Your Job for a Life of Freedom. He hosts a weekly show called The How to Quit Working Show that features lessons from freedom fanatics who quit their soul-sucking 9-to-5 job and created a business that lets them live a passionate life of freedom. Jeff also writes for several media outlets, including the Huffington Post, Lifehack, and Elite Daily. Most of all, Jeff is a freedom fanatic, fiercely devoted to finding a better way to do life. So Jeff, it seems like you don't like tech support people telling you how to clear your cache or restart your computer. <laughs> we must be friends on Facebook. You know, it's 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 annoying when uh, the solution to every software problem seems to be clear your cache, and then I have to re-enter all my passwords and <laughs> re-enter uh, all the URLs and everything. All the autocomplete stuff goes away. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, crazy. That's the first thing. I mean, I've done tech support, and usually that's the first thing that they tell you to do. Why don't we just make software that doesn't require you to clear the cache all the time? That'd be that'd be really cool. I think actually it's called Linux. Uh-huh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of the diehard uh, techie boys like Linux, but it's not user friendly. It's not Windows. It's not the Mac. So most people don't use it. So on top of teaching others how to quit working, you also have a very successful podcast that is sitting at number three, I believe, in iTunes. Tell us a bit about that. I actually have two, Steve. I have a uh, the How to Quit Working show. I've been interviewing uh, freedom fanatics, people who have quit their job and started a business uh, because they wanted to create an amazing lifestyle for themselves. And people who've done that successfully have been doing that for about uh, over two years. We just released episode 205 today. Wow. And then I just started a daily tips podcast. And that's the one that has been topping the iTunes charts lately. And uh, that is called How to Quit Working Daily Tips to Make the Shift. And that's a simple actionable five-minute tip every single day of the week for how to quit your job and start a business. Sounds great. That's excellent. It's a blast. So before we get into your online course and how to quit working, how do you like to relax when you're not working? How do you unwind? Do you have any hobbies? I am a huge old house fanatic. I love old architecture and old homes, and I have an old building that I work on a little bit. I help some friends do the same, and I also like to just kind of putter around and do things with my hands. It's it's so much different than than my business, right? Because it's so physically tangible, whereas much of my business is not physically tangible. I know. We spend too much time online and uh, not in the real world. Yeah. Now, have you ever worked for the man in a nine-to-five job? And if so, how did you make that shift and quit your work? I did. I worked uh, in a nine-to-five job for uh, about from my early twenties, well, and until uh, April of two thousand twelve. You know, and the story that I that I tell uh, frequently on these shows is is that you know I, I I tried to quit twice. The first time I tried to quit, I wasn't ready. I didn't know what I was doing, and uh, I chickened out. And the second time, I was much more well prepared. I had a, a solid business concept. I had a proven product or service. I had clients lined up before I quit. And that was the time when I was successful. And really what How to Quit Working is about, it's about closing the gap and the difference between that first time, uh, the difference between making an unsuccessful attempt to quit your job and start a business and making a successful attempt. And you talk about the shift. And when you talk about the shift – you're talking about uh, making that shift from a nine to five job to quitting your job and working for yourself. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, your online course, How to Quit Working. Give us a bird's eye view of the course. What do you cover? Who's it for? And why should people be signing up for it? Yeah. Well, How to Quit Working, we actually have recently uh, changed the name of it to Shift. 
So the shift program is for people who are working a full-time job and they have figured out that there is something more to life. They figured out that this whole nine to five thing just isn't for them and they know there's something else out there. They know that more is possible and they want to go after it. But the problem that they have is that they grew up in, like every other normal human being. They grew up in a household that didn't teach them anything about business, didn't learn about entrepreneurship in school, and they have bills to pay and they have things to do. They have a life and just don't know how to go about making the shift from working for someone else to having their own business. And we will give you not only a community of people to support you through that transition, it's a community of, of myself and our, our coaches and whatnot, but also a group of your peers to work through that process with and also uh, a ton of online training, which is basically uh, an MBA, uh, a very practical MBA, everything that you need to know to quit your job and start a business. It's amazing that the whole system, the education system, the the culture that we're in is set up to get you educated and then get you into a nine to five job. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of our even our family and parents and friends, uh they're all basically in that nine to five job and that's what they've learned. They've learned that from their parents as well, that once you get to a certain age and you have a certain level of education then you go work for some company and that's it. You know, you don't do anything else. So do you see that shifting now, that, that mindset is shifting now? It is. And I think that there's, it's kind of a perfect storm, right? Because we have two things going on. We have millennials out there, those folks that are, you know, basically under 30. And what they're saying is, you know, I've looked at my mom and dad and I see that they've been working for somebody else and they're not happy and they don't like it. And in many cases, they're laid off right now and looking for work. Grandma and grandpa did that and they didn't seem to be happy. They didn't like it. I'm not going down that path. They said they're saying to themselves and to each other and to their parents and their grandparents saying, no, we've seen how that's worked for the older generations and we're not doing that. We're doing something different with our lives. And then the other piece of uh, – the other thing that's happening in this kind of perfect storm is we have the internet that has opened up the possibility for shows like this and shows like mine and, and, and many shows and many different outlets and ways for people to learn about what's possible. And uh, information is no longer a barrier. So I think when you have the freedom of information and you have a generation of folks that are saying no more to a model that hasn't never worked, but we just we're just now questioning it. Uh, you have a huge shift in the mentality. And I recently heard I don't have the specifics on this, but I recently heard that like at the turn of the last century, so like the late 1800s, only 10 percent of the population actually worked from some for someone else. The rest were entrepreneurs. And I think that we're going to get back to that kind of a percentage. Wow. So the, that statistic, was that for America? It was. It's interesting because nowadays, and you mentioned that um, layoffs are happening and that's happening quite a lot now. Um, yeah. the, the traditional stable jobs, even working for the government, are no longer that stable. Um, it's happening all the way from the top down, from the directors down to the managers to the workers that are, you know, we call the peons that are actually doing the work. Yeah. Um, it's happening all the way down the line that uh, your job is no longer as stable as it used to be. And the cost-cutting measures, the, you know, the cutting, the downsizing, is it's happening anywhere. It's happening everywhere. And it's no longer about getting into a company and having that stable job that we were drilled into having. You know, we were told that, yeah, work for a good company and you'll be there for life. You, you don't you don't do that anymore. You can't do that anymore. Right. It's a it's a huge shift. And I think that the biggest thing that we have to realize is we have to remember that uh, this whole idea that a job is security. Well, that's a lie that was fed to us by the by the corporate world to make us want to go do that thing, to make us want to go work there. And we now see with the massive amounts of layouts, layoffs, look at Detroit, you know, a, 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 an entire region that was built around an industry that's virtually gone, you know, and then tell them, 
right? Tell them that jobs are the way that you get security. And, and then when you, uh, I've interviewed uh, almost 200 successful entrepreneurs on my podcast who have made this very shift that we're talking about. And once you've gone from employee to entrepreneur, you don't look at being an employee as security anymore. You, you, you look at that as being insecure. You look at having your own business and having control of your own, uh, income and your own schedule and having control of your own destiny and outcome in life. That is security. That is so true. And also it's, it's, it's also the culture. It's also the technology. It's also where we are right now that things are changing used to be that uh, you could go work in a factory and be on that uh, <laughs> on that factory floor and uh, the conveyor belt, you know, putting parts together. Well, that's gone. You know, it's all automated. Yeah. Then there were the cars, you know, making the cars. That's automated. A lot of stuff is changing because of new technology and the way things are being done. I think it's a good thing overall because we're using less our hands and our bodies and more our mind, you know. We're thinking more, we're learning more, and we're, we're actually doing more with our mind rather than our, our physical presence being there. Even operating heavy machinery or going out into where it'd be kind of dangerous to go, that's kind of slowly also being automated as well so that we're not in that danger as much. So a lot of things are changing because of technology and because of where we are right now. And it's, it's a good idea to take a look. I, I look at, I mean, I like these science fiction shows like Star Trek and uh, some of these other shows, you know, predicting the future and what the future will bring and how we will live in the future. And they all portray this sort of almost ideal environment where, again, we're working. It, it's, it's work, but it's not what we consider work now. Mm. So we're contributing to society in a different way. And it's more what you like to do rather than you're put into a job where you're doing something and you don't necessarily enjoy doing it. It's something you have to do because you need to earn that money. So it's more about what would you like to do and what are you good at? And we're not there yet, but <laughs> we can get there with uh, with courses like yours, you know, where we can learn to harness what we like to do and how we can leverage that and make a living out of it. So your course actually, um, it's, it's a pretty detailed course. I mean, it has six modules and I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive into this course. Cool. And module one talks about designing your life and your business. Now tell us a little bit about that. If, if you don't go about starting your business in the right way, you'll end up with the worst of both worlds. You'll end up with the worst aspects of entrepreneurship and the worst aspects of having a job. And what we do is we start in this module by creating what we call a lifestyle blueprint. And that's where you really step back and you say, okay, what do I want my life to look like? What do I want every aspect of my life to look like? Do I want to travel? How much money do I want? Do I want to uh, work in this specific area? Is there a specific type of work that I want to do? Are there specific things that I absolutely hate doing <laughs> that I want to make sure I never have to do in my business? We look at all of those things and we create a picture of what you really want your life to look like. And then we build a business that fits into that and supports that desired lifestyle. And that's the most important step of the entire program because if you if you don't think about that stuff first, you end up creating a business that just doesn't make you happy. And that's no good. There's no point in that. <laughs> no, I mean, you have to provide some kind of value to somebody, something that somebody wants. Now, how do you determine that? Do you have um, exercises, uh, templates? How, how do you determine what value you're going to provide? In module number two, we focus on product creation. And the great thing about the way we do it is, you know, we know that people out there who are taking this course don't have, uh, they have bills to pay. And they don't have a bunch of money to invest in the business. They, they need it to work. So that's why we start by opening up conversations with people who are interested in that area of expertise that you have or that area uh, where you're looking to provide a product or service. And then we find out what problems they have and then we build a product that a product or a service that, ful that 
fills that need and solves those problems. And the great thing about the way that we do it in the SHIFT program is that we start by opening up those conversations with people and identifying their problems first and identifying what are they looking for to, uh, to solve those problems so that we can, f- I, so that we can create something so that you can create something that will meet that need. And that way you'll know that you've got something that people actually want because we know you don't, you, you don't have the ability to just spend a bunch of time and money on something and then just hope that it works. Yeah. I'm looking at, um, uh what you accomplish in each module. And you talk about in module one, you accomplish, you accomplish stuff like identifying the value you have to offer that customers want, determine who wants that value, your niche, identify two specific ways to begin learning about your customer. So that's a good starting point is you got to figure out what your niche is and what that value is. Yeah. In uh, module two, you talk about product creation. You talk about, building relationships with customers who will keep buying from you. Absolutely. How to design a product that people will be lined up at your door to buy. You know, how do you figure out exactly what products to create? I mean, there are so many different products. There's info products. There's, there, there are an endless supply of different ideas for products. How do you determine what product you should create? Yeah, you know, and that's why we start by creating the lifestyle blueprint and really understanding what it is that you want your life to look like, right? And if you are somebody who uh, wants to be location independent, well, then something that you have to go somewhere and do is probably not going to work for you. So um, it, it varies widely by, by the situation, but we always start with what is the thing that you want out of life? And that's got to be the first thing. What, what do you really want your life to look to look like so that you can create something that you can deliver or have delivered in a way that's compatible with that. But then the second thing that you have that's critically important is that how does your customer want that thing delivered? All right. So do they, is that something that they want, uh, delivered in a, and I don't mean like, you know, delivered like Amazon delivers a package, but I mean, how do they want to receive that value? Do they want to receive it in a one-on-one basis? Well, that may or may not be a fit. There are people out there, you know, we always talk about location independent businesses and all that. And a lot of people love that idea and a lot of people want that. There's other people that just love the idea of going into a company or going into your home and helping you with something and having that be part of your business. You know, so when you marry, what you have to do is you have to marry what you want out of life and what you want your lifestyle to look like with what your customer wants and what your customer actually will pay money for. And where those two things overlap, that's, that's how we figure out how you'll deliver and what format your product or service will be in. That's a really good point because if you are a people person and you do like to be in front of people and you do like to interact with people rather than just uh, online, then you, you got to take that into consideration. Absolutely. So, so how do you identify and validate your ideas? You talk about validating ideas. How do you validate ideas? There's one very simple answer to that question. The way you validate an idea is you try to sell it. <laughs> because the only <laughs> way that you get validation of an idea, the only thing that makes an idea count as validated is when you have sold it. That is the only thing that validates an idea. So the way you validate it, you, obviously you start with, you start by having those conversations and you start by understanding what your potential customers want, what their problems are and what they want in order to solve those problems. But the thing that, that you do to either validate or invalidate it, and it's okay to invalidate it, is you try to sell it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people talk about uh, pre-selling. Do you believe in pre-selling as opposed to creating a product and then trying to sell it? So pre-selling meaning that you've got the idea, you've, you've almost, you know, you're, you're at the point where you can build that, that product, but you haven't quite built it yet. So you can sell it and see what the interest is. If there's not enough interest and you won't build it, but if there is enough interest, then you will go ahead and build that product. So is pre-selling one of the one of the things that you do? Absolutely. And and what what I would say is is rather than using a word like pre-sell, I would say you have to figure out a way to get financial commitment by doing the least amount of upfront work possible, right? So people who come through this program, like I said, they got families, they've got a full-time job, they're working, they don't have time to spend weeks or months or even days 
creating a product that nobody ever buys. And that's probably the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make is going off and creating a product or, or a service that nobody ever buys and, and losing a lot of time. So you've got to figure out what is the way that you can sell something that requires the least amount of work up front. Now, it's, it's okay to do all kinds of work after you've sold it, right? I mean, that's that's what business is about. You got to do work and you got to create that value. But uh, you, you got to do the least amount of work before you sell it as possible. Does that mean setting up uh, landing pages once you figure out what it is? setting up landing pages and trying to get people to actually commit? Well, I don't think that uh, for, for folks that are coming through the shift program, uh, they're, they want results fast. And uh, g- going the online route and driving traffic and building an online community is not necessarily fast. Uh, the, the way that you, that you get that, if, if you want fast results, and that's what Shift is designed for. It's not designed to spend, uh, you know, a, a year and a half or two years building up some kind of online community and building an email list and doing traditional internet marketing. It's designed for people who want to get results fast. And the way you get those results fast is that you got to get right to the people. You got to get right to the people who are going to want your product or service. And the online channel uh, does offer ways to do that. Um, but we also like to explore other ways, like just calling people up or using uh, using your your community, uh, using resources that you may have access to in your local community, or uh, or other ways to get in front of prospective buyers faster. Now you also have module three, which is the online launch, and in this, you will help determine and create your marketing message, create a great piece of valuable content you can use to entice people to give their email address, uh, set up all the logistics of your launch, create accounts with an email provider and payment processor. Uh, What do you consider a successful online launch? Well, the thing that's different about the way we do it in Shift is that uh, all these other internet marketing uh, gurus and and products and courses out there, they always want to teach you all kinds of of fancy, slick marketing techniques and and ways to, to market and sell your product. But they they then they then use those great marketing techniques to market it to people that don't have a product or service to sell. So that's why we got that figured out in module two. And in module three, we now take everything that you've learned, right? Because in module two, you identified, okay, what is it that these people want? So now you know, okay, working mothers who are in their uh, late 30s are really interested in this product about that that teaches you how to make a birdhouse with your kids, right? <laughs> I'm just making that up. But whatever it is, in module two, we determined what that thing is. So when we go to the online channel to begin leveraging the internet to sell that product, we already have something that we know people want. Right. So now you've, you've already had those conversations in module two. You have already figured out what is it that they want? Why does that, why does that mother in her late, that single mother in her late fifties want to know how to build a birdhouse? You understand that because you figured that out in module two. And then that becomes your message. Right. And, uh, you talk about creating a, a great piece of valuable content. You can use to entice people to give you their email address. Many, many marketers will tell you that email addresses are gold. Once you have an email address, you can follow up with that person and you can market to them. So what are some examples? Uh, is it, I mean, traditionally, we have an ebook as a giveaway. W- what do you mm-hmm. consider a good example yeah. of a valuable piece of content to entice people to give you their email address? Yeah, you know, anything, really anything that people want. And, and an ebook is a great op- op- option, right? So it's just, that can just be a short, uh, Something that you've written up on, uh, in a, in a Word document or a PDF that you offer out to people in exchange for your email list. But, but the, the key thing is that like in module two, you had, you had a discussion with, uh, the people who are interested in this product or service and you learned about them. You learned about what did they struggle with? What are they looking for? What problem are they trying to solve? So by now, you know, you've got a pretty good idea of what could you offer them to get that email list. And Steve, you make a great point in that the whole idea here is that we want to capture, we want to capture their contact information so that we can use that contact information to sell to them. 
because that's what business is all about, which we forget sometimes. Yeah, I think a lot of us do because we provide a lot of value and we keep providing value and keep, we keep providing value, but we don't actually sell anything. Indeed. And we should be actually creating products that people want and uh, providing that value. Yeah. So in module four, you talk about creating your business and uh, you talk about how to approach a business so it's fun and not a chore or, or it's not boring. Um, <laughs> how to create a simple business plan. And everybody hates business plans, I think. Uh, you know, people don't like yeah. doing those. Uh, how to figure out the money part of transitioning from a job to a business without stress or overwhelm because there's that fear that, okay, we're, we're getting out of this stable job and we have this money coming in. Now we're devoting all this time to doing this business and we're not sure if money's going to be coming in. I mean, you don't suddenly jump from a job to a business and have right. that stress. So you have some, some strategies around that and some information about how to make that transition. Uh, tell us about some of that. Uh, how, how do you recommend people do that? We actually supply a spreadsheet in the program that lines out sales goals for your business and it, it shows your expenses. And then you can use that to track how close you're getting to your number. And when I talk about your number, what I mean is what is the amount of money that you need to make in your business? in order to be able to quit your job and you do that business full time. And everybody has to have a really good handle on their finances and understand, okay, well, it costs me X amount of dollars every month to pay the mortgage, to put gas in the car, to put food on the table and all that. And you've got to get your business to, to some l l minimum level of, 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 uh, of comfort so that you can meet that, meet that need. And we provide uh, a video, a training video on how to do that as well as a spreadsheet that lets you track that. And how do you create an easy, fun business plan? <laughs> well, you start by not overcomplicating it. And I think that uh, the, the, the point of a business plan, there's, there's, kind of two main reasons why we use business plans. One type of business plan is used when you're going off to get uh, investors or you're, you're approaching angel investors or you're approaching um, venture capitalists. And that's not what we're talking about here. I, I'll leave that to other experts to figure that out. What you need when you're transitioning from your full-time job to having a business is you just need something simple that ensures that you have thought through the key parts of starting your business. Now, we've got a business plan that it comes with the program, uh, a, a great template. It's just answer questions, just fill, fill in the blanks. And, and it's very quick and it's very simple and it's very easy. And all you're doing is you're just making sure that you've addressed the main points, right? Have you figured out have you have you identified how you're going to do some marketing? Have you identified uh, how you're going to do your pricing? Have you identified what your products and services are? Have you identified your message? So the bottom line is just keep it simple uh, and use the template that we provide you, and don't feel stressed like it has to be like some big crazy eighty page thing that's going to go to a Harvard <laughs> contest or something like that. <laughs> I think that's what most people think of when they think of a business right. plan because they think of all the financial stuff as as well as a lot of stuff that they may not have right down to the last detail determine what it's going to be and how it's going to operate and how it's going to work. So, um, yeah, but that's something you have to really think about and it's something that you got to have clear up front. How are you going to make the money as well and, how, and what are you going to do? What are you going to provide? as part of your business. Now, you also talk about determining a pricing model for your products. How do you determine a pricing model for your products? You know, one of the reasons that we have this module in the program is that it, it, it what, what folks tend to do is folks tend to have, when you're going from a job uh, to having your own businesses, we tend to think in terms of an hourly rate. Even folks who are salaried still think in terms of an hourly rate. And uh, what we have to do in business is we have to shift away from this idea of thinking about hourly rate. And we have to think about the value that we're providing to the, to the world. Generally speaking, if you think of, uh, if you think in terms of hourly rate, you're going to underprice your products and services, you're going to undervalue, and you're going to end up running yourself into a, a not good financial place. So what we do here is we look at, first of all, changing your mindset from 
thinking about an hourly rate to thinking about pricing based upon the value that you're bringing to the marketplace. And then most importantly, ensuring that you structure that price point that such that you can grow. If you are providing some service, say you're providing like a, um, a, 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 a uh, for example, we have a client right now that's starting a, a content creation, content strategy business, right? So say she goes out and thinks of her business from an hourly standpoint and she thinks about it from, I think I'm worth, you know, 40 bucks an hour. I'm just making that up. So, so I go out and I bill this at $40 an hour. Well, what happens then is what, what you've done is you really just created yourself a job, right? Because there's not enough additional value in that for you to bring in other people to help and you still make money, right? So that needs to be something more like, you know, a hundred or 130. And again, I'm just making these numbers up. Obviously it varies widely depending on the, the product or the service the situation, in the industry and all that kind of stuff. But that number has to be vastly higher in most cases so that you can be sure that you have the additional margin to bring in people to help and to actually do the work so that you're not the one stuck doing the work all the time because who wants that? Yeah, that's true. We do tend to undervalue what we produce a lot of times. And uh, we also think about, you know, if we think about, say, an ebook versus something like a membership site where you're actually spending a lot more time and training people and maybe you have video courses and other stuff that you spend a lot of time on. There are different pricing models for those. And we do tend to undervalue a lot of times what we produce. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, it, it's interesting. It's it's really good to get feedback on on how to price something that you produce. So that's, that's great yeah. that you have that in there. Now, you have module five on how to do marketing. And this is a big, big topic. A lot of times we don't do market marketing properly. We don't do marketing the way that it should be done. Or at all. Or at all. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it's, it's very spammy and it can actually get you in trouble with Google and with Twitter and with all kinds of online services. So, you know, marketing, according to your module, marketing should be fun. Uh, it should be easy, and anybody should be able to do it. And it's one of the most important things that you're going to do for your business. Now, how do you plan to teach people to do marketing that is fun? How do you make it fun? Well, the first thing you have to do is you just have to relax about it. You know, it's not this big, scary, crazy thing. We just have this ridiculous notion that it's hard and that it's weird and that we're scared of it and, and all these things. And what you have to do is you have to just realize that, hey, all marketing is, is you just have a product or service that you love and you believe in and you're just talking about it. That's all it is. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm doing marketing right now, even though, you know, it doesn't seem like it, but that's what I'm doing. I've got this product that I love, that I believe in. I'm just talking to people about it. That's all I'm doing. Stay tuned. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook of your choice and a free 30-day trial membership. Just go to educationhackers.com slash book and choose from over 180,000 audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to educationhackers.com slash book and get started today. More next. Yeah, I think if you have a passion for what you produced and what you're producing, you talk about it naturally to anybody and everybody. And it's like a conversation, having a conversation with somebody. I think a lot of times we're Absolutely. not really marketing, you know, in the traditional sense. We're just telling people about it. And as a result of that, people come and they see what we have and then they buy. So yeah. it's a more of a natural, organic uh, way of marketing, I guess. And that's what people like. You know, people like to be told the benefits of something as opposed to here it is, you know, you have to get it. And a lot of the online marketing that I've seen, I think, through social media is kind of like that. It's you have to be careful how you market. And you also talk about best free and low cost options for online marketing. You know, what are, what are some of those? Well, there's a lot of ways that you can that you can do marketing online in in very inexpensive ways. You know, there's um, one of the things that that, that I uh, talk about in the course, and I think is really important to remember is when you're thinking about creating a product or a service, think about 
how many do you want to sell? And the thing that I'm just going to do is on my calculator really quick because I think this is so fascinating. You know, we always talk about selling an ebook on Amazon for $2.99. Well, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know. Amazon gets like 70% of that. So I don't know. Say, say you get like 30% of that. You make about maybe a buck on, on each one of those $2.99 ebooks. Well, if you want to make like a, just a modest $60,000 a year salary, you got to sell 60,000 of those books. <laughs> but if you have a uh, $1,000 product, you only got to sell 60 of them, right? And when, when you shift things like that, when you shift the, uh, the equation like that, now all of a sudden when you've got a thousand dollar product, does $50 seem like much to spend on advertising? No, not, not at, all. at all. But who, I mean, this is, this also comes back to, you know, your niche, your, your, mm-hmm. your audience, and you have to know who is willing to pay $1,000 for something as opposed to two ninety nine for an ebook, and you Absolutely. have to have those people uh, ready and willing to buy. So, you know that goes hand in hand. You have to make sure you have the right audience, and they are listening to what you are saying, and they are willing to buy. And you know, you talk about that as well. You know, marketing to the right people, and um, yeah, creating creating a low cost options for online marketing and we talk about that a lot i think there's a lot of stuff online where there's ebooks there's video courses there's youtube and there's a lot of hype about about low cost options for online marketing because social media is free i mean you can Mm -hmm. market on twitter you can market on facebook you can market on a lot of the social media but a lot of times it's not reaching the right people yeah yeah, well, you know, and that's why, and I'm glad you brought up the right people and the people that are willing to pay a thousand dollars, right? I mean, there's, there's just, uh, again, that's a very general statement. A thousand bucks is a lot in some situations, and it's, it's nothing in other situations. But when you look at finding the right people, that's why we spend so much time in module two, connect, identifying and connecting with those people, and really understanding what they are willing to pay because you may have a group of people who are not willing to pay that thousand dollars. So maybe you need more like a $300 price point. But uh, what I could say for sure is that $2.99 is not going to get you there anytime <laughs> soon. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, I think the important thing, just like you said, uh, Steve, is you have to, kn- to know what that market is and you have to know what they want and you have to know where to find them. And that's the key thing about social media is going to the right places on social media. I mean, we say social media, but that's, that's like saying, I don't know, like the earth. I mean, it's just, that's just, that's like everybody. <laughs> you got to be in the right place where the right people are and you got to be interacting with them in the right way in order for social media to work. Yeah. Social media is such a broad, broad area and that can include so many different sites and services. Sometimes, um, you know, I've seen individuals just marketing on Etsy or Instagram. Mm-hmm. And that's all they do. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and they make a great, you know, income because they're focused very, very, very focused on one particular social media platform or something that they know really well and they know how to use that really well. Then that's, and that's key. I'm so glad you brought that up because, you know, the one thing that you can't do is you can't focus on every social network and every fly by night one. I mean, three of them probably came and gone just while we were having this conversation. (laughs) But, you know, and I think that's important to remember. And I think one of the, one of the things that happens is we get caught up in this. Oh my God. I heard about this, uh, this lady who's getting, making thousand bucks a minute on, uh, Pinterest or Instagram or something like that. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's great. But that's because she's focused there. Right. And she is, she's focused on that. You need to find your medium and you need to focus on that one. Yeah. We got sidetracked. We did. (laughs) We we got sidetracked. Internet is a really, really bad thing, you know, for that. Even if you're surfing the web and you're on one website, you click on something else, you go somewhere else. It's kind of the same. when we, (laughs) who look at social media and marketing yeah. is that, okay, somebody's done really, really well on this platform. We should be on there and we should be doing that. Yeah. Well, that's not necessarily true. You know, it may not be for you. So try to find something that really works well for you and stick with it. 
and don't try to do everything and don't try to be everywhere. I know some people are like I, I interviewed uh, Kai Kawasaki, but he's mm-hmm. got a team. He's got a team of people and Guy Kawasaki is a brand. The name is a brand. So he, he needs to be everywhere. He's on every platform and, and so on. But, you know, we're not Guy Kawasaki. <laughs> we're trying to market a particular product or service. And uh, we need to know where we should be for, for that. Absolutely. Now, on Module 6, you talk about automating and growing your business. And this is a topic that I really love. I love automation. Having worked in the IT field for a long, long time, yeah, automation is great. You know, if you can do it right, <laughs> and if you've got something good to automate, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, if you can, if you can automate it, I mean, if your business relies on you producing something unique and different every time, maybe you can automate it. So you talk about how to approach business as an enabler of lifestyle, how to leverage other people to do the things you don't want to do. I guess is kind of the the outsourcing you know, for our work week kind of mentality, which is, um, which is great because you, you don't want to be trying to do everything yourself, right? I mean, you need to know what you're good at and what you can outsource. And you also talk about coaching and consulting to boost your income and build your business. Tell us some more about automation and growing your business. You know, I think that there's, there's a couple of things and, and really when it, when it comes to, well, I mean, we, we all want to be able to go on vacation, right? We all want to be able to step away. We all want to be able to take off early because it's a nice day and you have to have two things really in in order to make that happen you have to have you have to have automation and you have to have people right because you can't automate everything and you shouldn't automate everything but you also have to have people and as your business grows and this is this there's a reason why this is the last module in the in the program is is if you if you try to jump to this stuff right away then you're going to be focusing in the wrong place right because if you try to automate anything and you don't have that product or service yet, I think so often we hear about automated marketing and we get all excited and we run to that and we're like, okay, wait, wait what's actually the marketing that we're automating or what are we, what's the actual thing that we're automating? You got to have that product or service down first and you got to have those customers coming into your pipeline first and then you can look at automating but uh there are so many things that uh that you can automate and so many things that you can have uh done for you and and done quickly and easily and i also think that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity around outsourcing and that uh, word kind of gets a, a bad rap sometimes and it's and i i just i wish it didn't because there's a lot of things in your business that I would go so far as to say a majority of the things in your business you might not want to do. Like you might have no interest whatsoever in the accounting. You might have no interest whatsoever in uh, the the uh, uh, the technology part of it. There's always people out there who absolutely love those things. I talked to somebody. I met somebody at an event the other day, and I mean, she just loves everything about bookkeeping. She was so excited about it. She just loves digging in there, rolling up her sleeves, and keeping the books. And thank goodness we have people like her to do that for people like me who that bores the heck out of, (laughs) right? So outsourcing is really a wonderful opportunity to get the right people doing the right things. And I manage large teams in in corporate for uh, well over 10 years during my uh, technology and and corporate career. And uh, I learned a lot about how to manage people and about how to use people. And that sounds bad, but it's not. But how to use people to get done the things that you need to get done and get them done in an efficient way possible. And you have more opportunity and more options to do that as an entrepreneur today than ever. Yeah, it's it's all about automation for large companies as well, because again, we come back to this, you know, conveyor belt in these factories, you know, and uh, those processes are all automated. You know, making cars are automated. Now we're getting into the corporate world, and we're looking at, you know, what processes and systems can we automate, you know, that we don't necessarily have to do manually. So mm-hmm. a lot of stuff is being automated that traditionally would not be. Um, you know, selling stuff online, it, it can be automated. You have a website, you have a, have a platform that's anytime somebody wants to buy, they can just go online and click a button and make their payment and it's automated. So there's a lot of stuff that's being automated in terms of business. Now, what are the things that you, if you're creating a new product and you're 
you know, trying to automate, what are the things that you look for that you think you can automate for every product or service? I think it's the things that the, the things that you want to automate are the things that don't differentiate you. For example, uh, I personally phone, I personally make a phone call to everyone who registers in shift because I want to welcome them and I want to learn a little bit more about them. And that is that, that takes time, but that's perfectly fine. It's a, it's a great thing to do. I enjoy doing it and it's a huge value add. It's a huge relationship builder, uh, for the course. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing overall. I would never automate that. I would never put some, uh, uh, pre-recorded message. Now there may be, come a day when, uh, you know, th- there has to be other people that, that do that. But um, that day is not here yet. I think you got to, re- you just have to realize that uh, y- you have to make what you do special, right? What you are offering has to be special in some way. And if it's all a hundred percent automated, then it's a hundred percent not special, <laughs> right? You you can't automate everything. You have to remember you have to keep it. You have to keep a, a level of touch there, and the and what's that level of touch and what is unique about your product and service will always be different, and it better be different. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, if I think about this more, and we come back to you know some of these sci sci fi shows again, it's it's more about your knowledge and your information. So. Mm. The other stuff, maybe it can be automated, but nobody can really replace you when it comes to your knowledge or your information, you know, your, what you're sharing, the message that you're sharing. So sure. that, that is never going to be automated unless they, you know, artificially replicate your brain or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> well, IBM is working on an artificial brain right now, actually. <laughs> Best of luck to them. Yeah. So you also have some other, you know, things that you provide with your course. I mean, one of the things that you provide is an accountability partner. Yeah. You know, we just basically take folks as the registrations come in, we, we take folks and we pair them with somebody else who can just kind of be a buddy as they go through the system. You know, we try to pair folks based on their time zone and whatever we know about them, but, uh, we don't put any structure around this relationship because we want the two individuals in the program to work together and decide how they can work with each other to support each other. And sometimes, uh, some, some of our, 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 our members will do, uh, like a monthly Skype call. Some of them will, uh, just email back and forth. Uh, but the, the beauty of this relationship is that you have somebody else who is in the program who is doing, who's going through the same program that you are and is in the same situation and is using the same tools and techniques to get the same desired result. And it's just great to have somebody that's just kind of there by your side. Sounds great. I'm going to read a, a quote from your, your website here. And it goes like this. Using the How to Quit Working System, a $5 box of business cards, and a free Facebook page, I made $7,250 my first month in business. I thought this was going to take years and wasn't even sure it was possible. With the techniques and how to quit working now, I went from unemployed with a sack of bills and about to be evicted, spending $500 twice on premium seats, enjoying one of my favorite passions, Cardinals baseball. Thanks, Jeff, and how to quit working now. Daniel Vaughn, St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. So you have some amazing... Uh, reviews there for your course. That's excellent. The stuff works. All right. Now, my listeners are people who are either just starting to create their first online course or trying to figure out ways to improve their existing course. So some of the questions are meant to help answer their questions. What was the biggest mistake you made when you first started creating your online course? Creating something that nobody wanted. Uh, because the, and it wasn't this one, this was the one that I did right. But, uh, yeah, I mean, a, a very long time ago, uh, I created a, a program that, um, just completely missed the mark. And I, I just went off in a vacuum and I created it all by myself without any input or any feedback from any customers and spent a lot of time on it and nobody bought it. Well, isn't that the story? Isn't that what most people do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's stop that. <laughs> What was your workflow like when you created your course? How did you determine what to include and what not to include? 
Well, I had been running the, the platform and doing some coaching for a while, so I kind of knew what people needed, and I coupled that with my experience as well as all of the great insights from all the guests on the How to Quit Working show. Um, but really, it was about uh, sort of just just knowing what is the path that is going to get folks to success. And I think the the order of the modules that you go through in this program, it looks really off the wall to folks because uh, it's like, well, why would you, you know, why would you create a product before you do marketing and all that kind of stuff? And uh, it's it's designed very intentionally to put you through the process in the way that keeps the focus in the right place through the entire process. You mean do the marketing first before you create the product? Absolutely, get you because you've got you've got to get out there in front of people and you. I shouldn't say so much marketing, but opening up the conversation, having the conversation with folks about and learning about them and learning about what they want. Uh, what platform are you using to host your course and why? Uh, Optimize Press. I don't know because it's 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 what I bought at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it it's it, it's fine, and, and, and I, I view I view that as kind of a commodity kind of a thing, right? I mean, it's like you know, it it, it, it works. It's good. I like it. I'm not going to change um, because it works and I own it and I've got it. Yeah, it's it's a great tool. Actually, a lot of people have said the same thing that they use Optimize Press. Yeah. So why didn't you go with something like Udemy or Skillshare? Um, here's the thing that you got to really think about. They're going to take a cut and that's fine. I'm perfectly fine with that. But I got to ask the question of what are they going to give me in return for that cut? So are they going to are they going to send, send more customers my way because people are going to find it in that marketplace? Uh, if if you believe that that benefit outweighs the piece of the pie that they're going to take, then that's a good way to go. Um, I what what I was designing this for was to be a strategic key revenue generator and centerpiece of my business because part of the purpose of the shift program is to actually. Uh, bring people in and get them to a certain level and prepare them for one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is another part of our business, right? So I wanted in, I wanted to have complete and total control over the product, the marketing of the product and every aspect of it. So that's why I did not go with one of those services. I think that if strategically in your business, you believe that the additional reach that that platform will give you. In other words, people are already going to that platform looking for online training type solutions. If you believe that that will outweigh the cut of the pie that they're going to take, then that's probably a good option for you. Yeah, I've heard different stories from different people. And one of the, the key things is that if you have a lower cost course, then it kind of makes sense to maybe, you know, use Udemy or Skillshare or one of these other platforms because what happens, especially on Udemy, is that a lot of times they will put all the courses on sale for $10. So regardless of whether they're a $1,000 course or $299 or whatever, your course could be on sale, as long as you participate, of course, and most people do, your course could be on sale for $10. Wow. And out of those $10, you may get a few dollars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you have a lower cost course, you don't want to do any marketing, you just want to put it out there, then Udemy and Skillshare may make sense. So how do you protect your course content and videos? I don't. <laughs> I mean, it's protected with a password. Um, but the reality of it is you, you, you can't f you, you, in this business, you can't focus on that. Like you can't um, you can't put energy towards protecting that stuff because the reality of it is, yeah, people are going to steal it. It's going to happen. And uh, if you just you just can't stop it. You got to take that energy you're worried about people stealing it, and you got to put that energy towards marketing it. And then everybody's ahead. Now, do you host your videos on Vimeo or YouTube or somewhere else, or on your own website? Wistia. So Wistia is a great platform. Cool. It's it's worked really well. Yeah. And what payment system did you end up using, and why? I use Infusionsoft, and I uh, use it because, uh, you know, at the time it was the most capable and the most flexible, and that's what I chose. And uh, I'm not switching now because <laughs> that would be too much of a pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah, Infusionsoft is is more than just a payment system. It also mm -hmm. lets you manage all your users. So, mm -hmm. and then once they're in Infusionsoft, you can tie that into other platforms and other systems as well. So you have all your users in one place. Now, how do you support your course members? I believe you have a LinkedIn group. We have a LinkedIn group, and uh, we have a lot of activity out there. Folks 
post when they have questions, when they have comments. We post new content every week. Uh, that might be just a, a lesson or a reminder or a question or something. And uh, when folks are frustrated or uh, they're wondering what to do or looking for help, support, guidance, they go out there uh, to the group and uh, they post and uh, we have great conversations. I love it. And how do you market your course? What's been most successful? Social media, blog posts, webinars, or something else? Well, you know, we, how to quit working has, has become a, a platform, right? It's, it's, it's a podcast. It's a blog. It is a, uh, in, a national media presence. I write for, uh, Huffington Post and Elite Daily and, uh, and Lifehack. So it's really a combination of all of those things. We also get organic traffic through Google. Um, I also speak. I think the short answer is, uh, we get traffic into our funnel in a lot of different ways. And again, I, the, the shift program is only one piece of, of our entire business, right? So we look at, uh, we don't look at selling products to customers. We look at bringing in leads and building relationships with them. So, uh, we bring folks into a relatively complicated sales process that involves, uh, we use, we use telephone prospecting, uh, we use, um, we use telemarketing and, uh, we offer folk complimentary, uh, one-on-one sessions where we sell products and we sell our coaching. We sell shift that way sometimes. Um, so again, I think my, it, it's challenging for me to answer that because we look at the sales process as 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 a as being customer based, not relationship based. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes total sense because you're everywhere, basically. Um, yeah, <laughs> and that's that's the key. And also, you're not just looking to make that one sale. You want to have these customers for the long term. Absolutely. Take a few minutes and offer your best, most practical advice to anyone thinking of creating their first online course or training. Don't create it. Sell it. <laughs> <laughs> And then if anybody buys, create it. And, you know, this is, this is uh, a topic that I am, well, we talked a little bit about this, but I'm very passionate about it because I have made the same mistake that everybody makes. And it's almost like a rite of passage. Like you have to make this mistake, but you really don't because you could just listen to what I'm telling you now and you won't make the mistake. Um, but having wasted a lot of time creating a, a large, massive course with lots and lots of videos, uh, that nobody bought. I know that you don't create anything until you sell it. And the way I did it with this program actually was, and I shouldn't say not anything. What I, what I did was I created module one and the first batch of folks that went through it. I think it was about six folks initially that went through it. And that was back in, it's like March of 2014, I think. But for those folks, it was more kind of laid out as a week by week kind of a course. So I said, Hey, when you join, you'll get week one. And the secret was that that's because only week one was finished. <laughs> and during week one, not only did I, you know, I kind of answered questions and facilitated folks through the first module and learned a ton. Uh, during week one, I was scrambling evenings and weekends to get module two done and did that for five additional weeks to get it out. And that was, that was rough. That was rough. <laughs> it was a lot of work those five weeks, but it was much, much better than spending a bunch of time creating a product that nobody bought. Right. Yes. Try to see what people want first and then create it. Yeah. Jeff, we've come to the end of the show. I could ask you a lot more questions about your course, but instead I'm going to leave a link to it in the show notes so people can visit your website and check it out for themselves. Thank you very much for being such an amazing guest on the show and for sharing such valuable insights and advice. It has been a real pleasure speaking with you. Where can people connect with you online? Yeah, you can go to howtoquitworking.com. And if you enter your email address anywhere on the site, then you'll get access to our free How to Quit Working Circle, which includes a free community. Uh, that's on Facebook. You'll also get a video training series and invitations to regular live training events. And I'd love to see you there. Thanks for listening to Education Hackers. Check out the show notes and click the love it button at educationhackers.com to send us some iTunes love. Until next time.